Welcome everybody. My name is Noah Chrisman and I'm Spurs Director of Public Programming. Thank you so much for tuning into this digital discourse today to provide a little bit of background for some people who may not be familiar with Spur. We're a nonprofit member supported organization that promotes good planning and good government through research, through education and through advocacy. We put ideas and action together to make for a better city and a better region. Uh, many of you here today are members, so thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member though, I do encourage you to join to support our ongoing work in making our cities and our region more prosperous, sustainable and equitable places to live. And you'll find more information online to do that at spur.org slash join. So, it's a really busy week at Spur. We have four more digital discourses scheduled throughout this week that I hope you'll join us for. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of what's going on. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., we're hosting an important conversation on how to provide an efficient and effective social safety net during these trying times. On Wednesday evening, again at 5 p.m., we're exploring the case for public transit fare integration with transit experts from the Bay Area, Seattle, and Montreal. Thursday at 12.30, we're discussing how to build a more equitable economy following the recession with the Insight Center for Community Economic Development, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and Assemblymember Rob Bonta. And then Thursday at 5 p.m., tune in for a conversation on the future of transportation in California with the Director of Caltrans, Tokes Omishakan. Um, but now we're talking about the true cost of res residential street parking. So free or inexpensive street parking near home is a benefit that many take for granted as residential permits range from 35 or less in San Jose to 144 annually in San Francisco. However, even residential permit holders often find themselves circling for parking at the end of the day while individuals without cars receive little to no benefit from this valuable curb space. Is the public right of way the right place for parking private vehicles? What are the true costs and benefits of residential street parking, considering all the externalities such as racial justice and carbon impacts? If we as a society decide to change how we allocate and regulate curb space, what steps would be required and how could we ensure that our new approaches are equitable? Tonight's panel is gonna explore these questions and much, much more. Um, and also a big, big thank you to the Urban Environmentalists and Streets for People for co-presenting this event with us. I know a lot of you here in the audience are affiliated with those groups. So thank you for joining us. In particular, I wanna thank Joanna Gutman for helping to coordinate this event. And uh, I'd love for her to pop on and say a few words about these groups and, and the, the program itself. So Joanna, thank you for being here. Thank you, Noah. And a warm welcome to all of you from Urban Environmentalists and Streets for People. Uh, Urban Environmentalist's mission is to address the climate and inequality crises by transforming cities and towns into inclusive communities designed around people rather than cars. Streets for People is an advocacy group campaigning for safe streets, fast and frequent transit, and dense, vibrant neighborhoods in the Bay Area and beyond. You can learn more about both of our organizations and become a member by visiting urbanenvironmentalist.org. And I'd like to kick things off now by passing the baton to our moderator, Raynell Cooper. Raynell is a planner on the parking and curb management team at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, working primarily on residential parking policy and the residential parking permit program. I know we're all very excited to hear from our expert panel about how we could be more intentional and people oriented in our use of residential curb space. So please take it away right now. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you, Noah, for the great introductions. Uh, On-street residential parking for how important it is to the functioning of cities is so deeply understudied and it's an underappreciated sector of the transportation planning world. Uh, that's due in large part to, as, as Noah mentioned, the popularity of the status quo and this idea that you could park for free or for very cheap in front of your house. It's seen as an inalienable, uh, almost God-given right. So I'm glad we're given this opportunity to elevate this crucial subject and kind of dig in uh, to the true cost of residential parking. Uh, let me introduce our panel for today. Uh, Anna Musig is an associate in the San Francisco office of Gale, a Danish planning and design firm. She has worked on placemaking and public realm plans across the country, including on San Francisco's Civic Center Plaza and the National Streets Service Project. Uh, Chris Elmendorf is the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at the University of California Davis School of Law. His focus areas include land use law, administrative law, and statutory interpretation. Uh, and Donald Shoup is a distinguished research professor of urban planning at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, 
He's the author of the incredibly influential 2005 book, The High Cost of Free Parking, and the editor of 2018's Parking in the City. Uh, we'll also be taking questions from uh, submitted in the chat. Joanna will be moderating through those and sending those to me, and we'll hopefully be able to get to some of them in the second half of the discussion. Uh, so to, to kick things off, I think it's good for us to sort of lay a, lay a groundwork uh, about what residential parking is all about. Uh, we've seen San Francisco adopt demand responsive pricing for its metered blocks across the city aimed at minimizing the circling for parking, creating approximately one open space per block. Um, Donald, what do you see as the major differences between regulating the curb in commercial areas versus regulating the curb in residential areas? Well, I think it, the, the regulations should be very specific to, to, the, to the area. And um, in San Francisco is a small city, but in physical terms, but uh, if you uh, line all the curb parking spaces up in a row, they would stretch from Canada to Mexico along the California coast. Um, and if you added them all up into one parking lot, they would be equal to a Golden Gate Park. Uh, so I think if you if you own the land equal to the size of Golden Gate Park, free parking would not be the best idea to use it in San Francisco, and I think it's been it's been neglected. I think that, that the curb lane has been left out in the rain for a hundred years. Um, uh, it's it's uh, if if you think of it in proportion to the uh, privately owned land that it surrounds, the curb lane is usually about 8% of the land it, it, uh, um, in the block that it surrounds. And for the, where the land value is very high, the curb lane is, is, is very valuable. But I think it has been, um, uh, the, the value of it has been, has been degraded in a sense because because both transportation planners and land use planners have ignored it. Because transportation planners uh, don't look at the curb lane because there's nothing moving. Uh, and land use planners don't look at it because it's in the roadway. It's, it's some, and so the only people who pay any attention to it in the city is the, um, the parking <laughs> uh, division. Uh, and they think of it, the natural use of the curb lane is for parking. Uh, so I think that, that uh, San Francisco has, has done a, a very good job of beginning to charge the right price for curb parking in its commercial areas. The SF Park is a, a, a landmark uh, advance in considering parking is that you should charge the, the lowest price for parking that will leave one or two open spaces on every block. That's a bit harder to do in, in residential areas, as, as you suggested. Um, but I think there's a way to, to let people know how valuable the curb lane is and what its potential is. And I, I just suggest one study that I did was in a, 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 a permit district in Chinatown in San Francisco. It's the densest area with a permit district. And it has a, a population of about 37,000 people and um, about 3,700 curb parking spaces. So there's one parking space for every 10 people. Um, so the, if you have a public meeting and ask people, well, what should we do with our parking? Well, the, the drivers will be the loudest voices of the room and the rest of the people wouldn't go to the meeting. Um, so I think the, the, the way to, to, to find the value of the curb is to do what Transport for London did. Uh, you know, a very, um, uh, similar city residentially, um, and they, they did a, took a representative survey of the residents um, and asked them, uh, what are your priorities for use of the curb? And they listed some alternatives. And the number one priority was trees and green space. Um, and the second was um, uh, um, playgrounds for children. Uh, Parking was number five. So when you ask a representative group of people, what is the highest use of the curb lane? I think that uh, in an area where there are many more people than there are curb parking spaces, you'll find that, that people do understand that, that, that curb parking has an opportunity cost. If you use it for parking, you can't use it for something else. Um, and I think that the way to uh, 
make this clear to people is to ask, when you ask them is to say, here's what we could give you if we started charging for curb parking. Um, and in Chinatown, I looked at the, uh, the you could look up at the, the value of off street parking, the cheapest off street parking in, 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 in Chinatown is $250 a month. So if you charge, say that, well, the meters, the, the permits would cost $250 a month and it would raise, um, I think it was, I can't remember, $11 million a year, uh, which would be, be enough to give a free transit pass to everybody who lives in Chinatown and to give free Wi-Fi to everybody who lives in Chinatown. So you would say the, the cost of giving these, these, these curb spaces away for $120 a month is that nobody gets a free transit pass and nobody gets free uh, free Wi-Fi. So I think you, you have to show people what the alternative use of the lane is and, and to show how it would be valuable um, to, to a representative group of people. That, that's a great point. I think in 2020, we're learning a lot about how to use the curb lane and how it could be valuable. We've seen uh, in San Francisco, the shared spaces program and all across the country and across the world, many parking spaces being converted into dining. Um, but I think this is, goes into a lot longer and older tradition going back to Parking Day. And Anna, you worked at Rebar that, uh, worked, that started Parking Day back in the day, this idea that we could use these parking spaces, just pay the meter and use them for something else. Um, these innovations, though, a lot of what we've seen in terms of turning the curb space into sort of more a, a greater public good, a lot of that has been focused on commercial corridors and has been focused around supporting the business sector. Um, so how would you sort of see placemaking and using the curb lane work uh, in a residential area? So Anna, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that from your work? Yeah, I'd love to share my thoughts. And I have to say, um, Dr. Shoup, I love what you're saying about how people don't understand what the curb is. I think that's extremely apt that because things aren't moving, you don't think about it as a piece of transportation infrastructure because you can't zone it in the same way as you zone other types of land. Um, people don't think about it as a land use issue, but in fact, streets are public land. Streets are a public spaces, are a public land. You know, I, I really like to um, invite people to think about streets in the same way as they think about, you know, Yosemite, this, glorious, really special protected space that is our public land, it's our shared resource. It hosts this incredibly complex ecology of public life. And if we really think about our streets that way, the curb becomes not just a unit to exchange on the market, although Chris, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that next. Um, it becomes incredibly vital to this important thing, which we care about more and more now, which is spending time together in public space. Um, so as you mentioned, I, I worked for Rebar briefly way after parking day was a thing and parking um, the first installation to turn, to, to pay the meter, but pay it for something else. Um, I think that's an incredibly you know, poetic um, art project to help um, make real what you're mentioning, um, Dr. Shoup, about um, how uh, parking space is incredibly undervalued. Maybe it's because we actually don't want parking spaces as much as we want other things. Um, and 2020 has taught us so much about what other things we might want from our streets and from our parking lanes. Um, I know this is about residential parking and I'll get there, but I just have to say, I used to live around the corner um, on Hoff Street in the Mission. And what's happened on Valencia Street in the last few months has really been incredible. Certainly, um, cafe tables, that's great. Music, that's great. But go to 16th and Mission and check out Manny's Victory Booth. Manny's is a local cafe. And instead of putting something that was, um, you know, rent seeking, like getting people to pay money to your business, to be able to spend time in the public space, lots of um, questions about how to, how to regulate that. It was actually just an invitation to participate in the democratic process. There's also lots of other examples. I'm here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is where I'm from. Um, recently visited George Floyd Square, which is um, a memorial to where George Floyd died about six months ago, uh, was killed by Minneapolis police officers. And there's been an incredible um, sort of pop-up um, community generated memorial. So there are lots and lots of things that we might value more than we value curb parking. So just wanna 
to put that out there that to really think about streets as public land, um, streets make up 80% of our public space in cities, parks and plazas, they only make up 20% of our public spaces. So, you know, I, I want to make a pitch for, for public life, for thinking about the things that we care about in neighborhoods. We'll talk about more of that in a second. And I also want to add something to the conversation we can pick up later around um, changing the way we think about the curb, zone, curb, curb areas and um, parking spaces as a really, really important tool in behavior change for mobility. Uh, we have a new administration going in to the White House, um, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and that really cares about uh, climate change. So transportation is the number one industry um, to our carbon emissions, 28% more than electricity, more than industry, more than agriculture. Giving, instead of just thinking about giving, uh, taking something away from somebody, making your parking space more expensive, making it more difficult to find, we really need to think about what we're giving back to people and that's uh, in order to incentivize a virtuous cycle of um, making transit and walkable bike -walk communities more attractive to people than the private car. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I think you get to this this good point of, of yeah, how do you understand the true value? And that's important to getting to the true cost, which is sort of what we're, we're talking to, to understand the, the value. Understand the cost, you have to understand the value and, and vice versa. And I think um, one way that you can get at, at a cost is by, is by pricing. We've seen this a lot. In the, as I mentioned in the metered parking and demand responsive pricing. Uh, right now, the way uh, primary way cities regulate residential parking is through a preferential permit system. Uh, it's called RPP in San Francisco. Other cities use other names. Uh, let's residents and their visitors park uh, for free um, just by uh, paying a, either annual permit price uh, or with a visitor permit type situation. Uh, but uh, either way, those costs are usually set either by what is politically feasible or by whatever it costs to run the program. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chris, though, I think that I, I think I know you have some ideas on what some other models for that would look like that could potentially um, have a great equity benefit and also kind of take away some of those externalities. Uh, well, I think I think credit for the models really goes to Don Shoup as the as the pioneer of of thinking about the idea of auctioning um, residential uh, parking spaces and then using the revenue for community improvements of one form or another. Um, I can comment a little bit on the legal context in which those uh, auctions would take place. Uh, Don might want to say a little bit more about the mechanics of the auction or what he would recommend. Uh, in California, the uh, central legal question is whether a fee charged for a residential parking permit is a fee or rather is a tax. And that might seem like a semantic distinction. Why do we even care? Uh, and the answer is that, is that the voters over the last generation have said in California through a succession of amendments to the state constitution, uh, we want to constrain local governments in their ability to charge taxes and we don't want local governments to avoid these constitutional limitations by relabeling a tax as a fee or a charge or something else. So we're gonna not look at the label that's used, but we're gonna look at something about the reality of what the charge is to determine whether it's a tax or not. If it is a tax, then under the constitution, uh, it can only be adopted by a local government with a referendum vote, that is 50% of the voters within the city have to approve the so-called tax before it can take effect. And if the revenue from the tax goes not to the general fund, but to a special purpose, such as improving uh, uh, transit accessibility within a neighbor or distributing the proceeds to give free transit passes or parklets or what have you, some, some de designated purpose other than the general fund, then the tax would have to be approved by two thirds of the voters in a referendum vote. And this would not be a neighborhood vote, this would be a citywide vote. So the question of whether the um, uh, market priced curb space is a tax or is, a, is not a tax turns out to be quite significant. Fortunately, I think that so long as there's a reasonable method for approximating the market value of that space and 
uh, people who want to buy use of the curb space aren't charged more than the market value, um, the courts will not characterize the fee as a tax. And the reason for that is that under the state constitution, there is an exception to the definition of tax for quote, a charge imposed for entrance to or use of local government property. And the California Supreme Court as recently as 2017 said, quote, the right to use public streets or rights of way is a property interest, which a local government may sell or lease and spend the revenue as they see fit. So there's still some question. And in fact, there's two cases pending before the state Supreme Court now that address this question, that raise this question about whether if the local government charges more than fair market value for access to its property, whether that is reviewable by a court as a hidden tax or not. Um, but again, if the method of setting the price for use of the curb is an auction, that's gonna recover a pretty good estimate of the market value of the curb space. And uh, if the revenue is generated in that way, I don't think there's any risk or a large risk at least that the courts would say that this is in fact a hidden tax that requires uh, voter approval. The one caveat I would add is that there's another provision of the constitution that addresses, this came out of proposition 218, that addresses fees that are incidents of property ownership. And fees that are incidents of property ownership are subject to a whole bunch of other restrictions. And an entitled homeowner who's had a residential parking permit for 20 years may say, well, of course my residential parking permit at $120 a year or whatever I pay is a, is a fee that is incidental to my ownership of property. In other words, like by virtue of owning a lot that has a house or a condo or an apartment on it, I derivatively own some interest in the street and you're charging a fee that is incidental to my ownership of property for the use of the street. Um, and I think that argument would probably fail with the possible exception of uh, pricing of existing curb cuts, right? So if somebody has a curb cut already and like the driveway is like physically connecting their uh, uh, private property to the street, maybe if the local government tried to charge market rates for that existing curb cut, uh, a homeowner would be able to persuade a court that that is actually a fee that is incidental to their existing ownership, their pre-existing pre ownership of the, of the private parcel of land. Um, the other thing that I would say is that any auction model that allows people who are not owners or uh, tenants of property in the neighborhood to bid on the use of that curb space is going to be an auction model that is easier to defend legally under the state constitution. Because if participation in the auction, that is eligibility to bid for the space, isn't tied to ownership of property, then it's more strained to argue that what is being charged is somehow a fee that is incidental to the bidder's ownership of some other property. So that's all I'll say for now about, about the law. Um, uh, the bottom line is I think there's a lot of flexibility here um, to uh, allocate the curb space in ways that uh, reflect um, sort of contemporary views of what the highest and best use of that space is. And uh, the state constitution is not much of a constraint. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely a lot of interesting points. I think anybody who works in government in California knows that dealing with the various uh, laws around taxes and fees uh, that have come about here, it can be very, very difficult. Oftentimes it, it can be pretty, pretty straightforward, but I think with this, it's oftentimes the combination of, of the laws and the politics and all those questions. Um, now, I, I think the, the coming back to the, the idea of, you know, what, what we do with an auction uh, is really interesting as well. This idea of a parking benefit district where, yeah, people will be paying a little bit more, but that money can go somewhere else. Um, and yeah, you've referenced that, that this is something that uh, Donald Shoup talks about in the high cost of free parking. 
Uh, so Donald, if you want to uh, describe for those listening, uh, what, uh, how a parking benefit district can be uh, beneficial not only to those who have cars, but also to a neighborhood uh, as, as a whole? Well, they already exist in California. Um, uh, 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 Old Pasadena is the most famous example that the, uh, it was uh, like many parts of old California that there were wonderful buildings in terrible condition. Uh, it was a commercial skid row and people thought it would be impossible to revive it. A lot of the buildings were empty above the ground floor and the, the nurses complained there was no parking for their uh, uh, for their customers, when the, the when the when the merchant and and all the people who work for for the merchant parked on the street and moved their car every two hours and complained about a lack of parking for their customers, and as, as soon as the city uh, said that if we put in parking meters, uh, we'll spend all the 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 uh, the, the uh, revenue from uh, parking. To, to improve the public sphere of, of old Pasadena. And now it's one of the most popular places to visit in Southern California. 30,000 people on a typical weekend go just to walk around because they rebuilt all the sidewalks. They put in new street trees uh, with wonderful cast iron tree grades and historic light fixtures. They cleaned up the alleys. Um, and as soon as the merchants heard that they would get the money <laughs> for public services in old Pasadena, uh, they switched from uh, uh, strong opposition to meters to say, let's run the meters till midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. The only thing that changed was when the city said, we will spend the money uh, on the streets where the meters uh, are living. So I, th I think there's a, 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 this Ventura is a good example of like this in California. San Diego has them. Uh, LA is beginning to have them. So I think that um, localizing the, 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 the revenue uh, is key to getting local public support. And I, 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 I agree with uh, Chris about when you, when you uh, uh, get the market price for parking, then you could consider alternatives. So I think that uh, if, if the, we, we uh, allocated parking by permits, not the only way to do it, but if you sold permits, uh, if I suspect that uh, if you, uh, Zipcar and other car sharing agencies could, could rent a space, that many of the spaces would be shifted over to shared cars. Um, and say, if you have a, a, a curb with you know, 400 residents and 20 curb spaces, I think 20 shared cars will serve many more people much more often than 20 privately owned cars with parking permits. Um, so I think the, the prices tell us a lot about what is the best use of, of the curb. And maybe a restaurant would be willing to pay more for the curb space than somebody who owns one car. Uh, and I, I think that markets, uh, uh, we rely on them for everything. Uh, it's just that parking, we short-circuited the market by saying that, oh, well, we know how to regulate it better. Um, and I think, um, getting back to the idea of curb cuts, uh, uh, and uh, more generally how to uh, uh, introduce the, the price, uh, market price permits, Vancouver did a very good, Vancouver and Canada did a very good thing. They went to market prices for permits, but they grandfathered everybody who already has a permit. They continue paying, it's like Proposition 13, for, uh, keeping your taxes low. Uh, but the permits turn over much faster than property ownership does. People are moving in and out all the time. And they suspected at the end of five years, only 20% of the permits would be owned by the uh, original uh, permit holders. So I think if you want to buy, uh, uh, buy off opposition to the uh, market price permits, one way to do it is to uh, grandfather everybody who has a permit and won't last forever or maybe not, won't even last for long. Um, and so I think that, uh, that, we, that without seeing what, what people are willing to pay for parking, we can't we can't understand uh, uh, what its value is. I did see a question from uh, one of the audience. Well, what about parking for disabled people? You know, which is a very important thing. There could be uh, 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 spaces that 
are only for disabled people. Um, that uh, the cities that do this, that they're usually on the end of the block, so it's easier to get in and out of the spaces for people who uh, have a disability. Uh, and it's, uh, it's it really important in California uh, because disabled permits are one of the most outrageous scandals that everybody knows that there's a, immense uh, abuse of these permits, you know, that, that all the wrong people get these permits. 12% uh, of all drivers in California have a disabled permit. And if you have no ethics, wouldn't you want one? Because it's a, it's a permit to park free anywhere for any length of time, wherever you want to be. Um, of course, it, it only takes a few people, a few bad actors, and we have a lot of bad actors, to, uh, to screw up the entire system. Uh, so what, uh, one of the solutions to this is what it came from Michigan and Illinois. In, in Michigan, they had the same kind of grotesque abuse of these disabled placards. Everybody has their own stories of, of seeing people jump out of a car and run into a, uh, a, uh, a gym uh, after they put up their placard. Well, what, what Michigan did was uh, they said we're going to have two kinds of, of, of disabled placards. One, the current one that you could use to park at Walmart or Trader Joe's or wherever. Uh, but the other one is a special placard is only for people who the doctor certifies as has severe mobility impairment. Uh, you know, having bad eyesight won't work or having a, uh, a sore shoulder won't work. But they very carefully describe what it means to have limited mobility. And when Michigan started this, they sent out a letter to everybody who had a permit and said that if you want to apply for this new permit that allows you to park free at the curb, you can get a certification for a doctor and, uh, and, and then turn this in. And only 2% of all the placard holders applied for the special permit that allowed free parking at the curb. I think California ought to copy that, that, that uh, law that uh, is, is already existed in Michigan and, and uh, in Illinois, because this, the, 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 the abuse of disabled permits is a stain on our society. I mean, it happens all the time, and SFMTA tried to, tried to solve it by saying, well, we, should, we want to be able to charge for uh, uh, disabled placard holders. And that didn't get anywhere in Sacramento. It's a state law of the cities that throughout California, the state requires that anybody with a disabled placard park free for an unlimited time. Yeah. So I think that, that anyway, I think that's something that San Francisco SFMGA could work on right now. Yeah, I know this, the state's been working through that. And I think that's, that is oftentimes with anything with curb changes, we're thinking to kind of to bring in the, the equity lens, I think there's there's very a lot of different levels of equity. There's economic equity. There's the kind of the, the greater question of trans, transportation equity and different the the different modes of, of how to bring this in. And I think um, the economic equity is I think something that uh, is is worth thinking about when it comes to parking benefit districts. And uh, I I want to mention there's a paper from the transportation research record from last year um, by Okashida and Alex, I think Alex Okashida and Richard Wilson uh, from Cal Poly Pomona uh, that talks about this because market rate, when we're talking about charging market rate for, for parking, the, the sort of the underlying thing is that in, in for virtually everybody that will mean paying more than they're paying now. Uh, and they, they did a great research study on, on what it would, the impact on low-income neighborhoods in Los Angeles uh, and the results show, quoting from the abstract, the results show that market rate programs are indeed regressive for households that purchase a permit, um, but because many low-income households do not have a car, do not park on street, or pursue alternative options to buying a permit, the magnitude of the effect of the income class is not as large as assumed. Uh, and the other point that is that it was made is that the higher, eventually the higher um, uh, permit rates could eventually support either um, subsidies for the lower income folks or uh, revenues for other transportation modes. Uh, and I want to come back to also a point that Chris had brought up about having a, a program that, that doesn't discriminate. And this is a, a question for Anna. I think um, one of the, the issues that we have when dealing with, with parking, something that, that comes back a lot, is, is who gets say over what happens on a curb. I think a lot of times people feel like they have direct ownership over a particular piece of curb. 
Uh, and this can apply to really any sort of public space. Anybody who overlooks a plaza will think that they have a lot more say on what happens in the plaza than anyone in the neighborhood. So when working on public realm planning, uh, how do you deal with the conflicts in, in terms of both you know, balancing the hyperlocal with this sort of community neighborhood level, uh, but also even bigger pulling in, thinking about climate change and thinking about all these other goals that a city has and wants to, to bring into the public realm? Yeah, I mean, such a challenging question. You're really asking about governance and governance of, of, a, of changes in the public realm. Um, this is something that we deal with a lot at Gale. We're often brought in to tackle really thorny hot button questions like parking, um, like what to do in the public realm. And there's, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, there's really no shortcut to engaging people about their place and what they wanna see there. Um, I certainly don't have a question of exactly what is the right governance model. I think some of the examples that are being brought up around um, local parking districts are great. I think changing the narrative around how to extract the most value from the curb lane to what are our values for our neighborhood and what are we missing in our neighborhood is where we would want those conversations to go. So exactly as uh, Dr. Shoup was saying in London, you know, when people were asked about what they wanted from their public realm, they wanted trees and places to play, not necessarily just parking. Um, I think a lot of us with COVID and the required lockdowns and quarantines and so on are really thinking differently about our neighborhoods. Um, people spend more time in their, many people spend more time in their neighborhoods. We spend more time walking, we spend more time local. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of a 15 minute city, you know, how can we have everything that we need within a 15 minute walk or short bike ride? Um, in many places, you still have the sort of zoning infrastructure for that. In Minneapolis, you know, once a streetcar suburb, there are vestiges of commercial uses in neighborhoods. But in many cities, even in San Francisco, um, you just have large swaths of primarily residential areas where you think, where, where there isn't the same type of um, thinking around uses other than parking in a neighborhood. So how could we think about, you know, thinking differently about um, pickups and drop-offs, um, civic places, small commercial establishments that fit in the in the public right of way. You know, I could think of like so many creative ways if you set up a different type of governance structure for a street um, that you could see sort of like what we're seeing on Valencia where we, you know, those of us who live in San Francisco or who spend time in San Francisco have, have gone to some of those shared streets and gotten super excited about what you see there. And, you know, you see all of the major urbanist publications writing like really excited, breathless, um, reviews about how the streets are never going to be the same. But why aren't we thinking that way about residential streets? Um, we absolutely could if we set up the right type of structure for folks to be you know, thinking about those places as shared public land, um, as places that they have ownership over, as they have, they have choice over. Yeah, I, th I, I think that's, that, that is a, a great way to sort of try to think about it and to get people kind of thinking outside of the box. Um, but we've got some great comments, uh, a few different comments from Zach and, and Jay and, and Hazel, all relating to this, the issue that you talked about, which is this, this question of how do you kind of, you have these land uses that are often completely residential and, and oftentimes don't have the exact, uh, the transit access needed to support kind of removing all of that parking um, or, or converting all of that parking. Uh, and I think that's that is one of the tough questions that kind of brings it almost a lot of it into the the, the realm of land use of how do you uh, how do you build buildings how do you allow for buildings that will that that are uh, or use that. Can I maybe like answer that question again, but more directly? It, you know, sure. Before thinking about rethinking about parking, you have to think about are there transportation alternatives for people. Um, you know, we're in this many people, especially who are in who have fewer transit options are in places where they basically have to drive. And with COVID, you know, taking transit carries more risks. And there are, as you know very well, working for SFMTA, there are cuts that are being made to transit. So in those neighborhoods to tell people that their, their, um, their, public, their public realm, their public land is being put to a market rate auction um, in, 
and not necessarily feeding directly into transportation alternatives for those people seems to be like an un undue burden. Right, and Chris, you, you have your hand up yeah, as well. I, I mean, I just wanted to jump in on this because I, yeah. I don't think it's quite that straightforward. I, I think as Don pointed out, if you have uh, an auction to allocate use of the curb or some other system of tradable rights to allocate use of the curb, that also creates possibilities, not only on the fiscal side for subsidizing access to man, mass transit, but also for creating new spaces to park bicycles. Somebody raised a question about e-bikes in the, in the comment threads. Right? E-bikes are kind of large, they're a bit cumbersome. I had one which I used to schlep my kids around when my kids were really little. Um, but if it were really easy to, pipe, to park e-bikes, in the curb space, then that would become a more viable transit option. Similarly, if car share companies, instead of you know, trying to find a gas station where they can you know, use a little bit of the gas station's parking lot to put their car share, if, they, if the car share companies could bid on any street in any neighborhood and they could take up one or two spaces in every block, then the car share model would be um, much more accessible to people. So I, I do think that market pricing of the curb lane opens up transit options. It's not, not just a way of allocating the existing uh, parking spaces among existing parkers. Well, I agree with that. And I'd say that at least in, in, in Los Angeles, one of the reasons for cutting back on transit service is the lack of riders. Uh, the, even before COVID, our biggest problem is the lack of riders. And this is throughout the country. Uh, the average occupancy of the bus is about 25% in the United States. Mm. So we don't like transit, we like transit riders. And mm. partly because we subsidize parking so much. Uh, I mean, if, if you own a car and you pay for the insurance and, and um, the registration and everything else and parking is free, why not drive? Uh, so I think that charging for parking will, it, will improve transit by increasing the number of riders. Say in Boulder, Colorado, they use the parking meter revenue downtown to give a free transit pass for everybody who works downtown. That is, it's a free fringe benefit. <laughs> the, the, the employers don't pay for it, um, but you just have to work there. You, everybody gets a free transit pass. And I don't think Boulder would be better off with free parking and no transit passes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that if your concern is uh, public transit, I think charging for parking and giving away free transit passes is a good idea. Now, I don't mean subsidizing transit. I mean, a, 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 not a supply side payment. If you gave it to SFMTA, who knows where the money would go. But if you, if you gave it to the, as permits for the residents, it's a demand side subsidy. That's, it's the rider is the one who decides whether they want to ride and where the, where the uh, you know where, where the buses ought to go? Yeah, um, just briefly the the idea of, of auctioning. I agree with that. And what uh, some cities and some universities do with uh, auctioning per parking permits is a very unusual thing to auction a lot of identical items. Uh, and for that, city issues the national government uses a, what's called a uniform price auction, is that uh, people just submit some sealed bids and say if there are 20 parking spaces on a block the top 20 bidders get the spaces and they all pay the same uniform price which is the lowest accepted price so everybody except the the, the lowest bidder gets a, a permit for less than they were willing to bid for uh, so I think it's a very fair way of, 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 of auctioning uh, uh, identical items and I think that uh, you would every year, if you read redid the, the the auction, you would find out how much these how much do people think the spaces are worth. As you said, if if shared car clubs could uh, could bid, maybe they would uh, get all twenty of the spaces. Uh, that in, in a very in a very dense neighborhood, I can't imagine a single car owner who could bid more than you know, uh, people who 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 share cars. And it could be what we haven't mentioned is a huge number of of spaces that we need for deliveries. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and for Uber and Lyft drop-offs, they ought to pay for parking as well. They, the micro payments, if they're there at the curb for three minutes, they ought to pay for three minutes uh, at a very high price because you have to charge a high price at the loading zone because it has to be empty a lot of the time. The problem with loading zones, they look underused because they're empty a lot of the time, but that's essential for, for a loading zone mm -hmm. or for Uber and Lyft. So I think if you, because they, they require a relatively high vacancy rate, they ought to pay a, a higher price for, for, uh, for using it, but they can bid for parking in the same way that everybody else does. Yeah, you touched on what I think makes the auction really interesting um, is, is, yeah, the, the question is really uh, how much is the uh, permit or the ability to park on the street worth to people? And we, it's, it's hard to really know until you, you implement something like, like a, a, a Dutch auction or a single price auction where you, where, where you say, okay, everybody, what's the, what's the most you would pay? And then you, you kind of go from there, find the, find the lowest that, that hits that number of spaces that you have and then, and then go from there. But that, that, is, that is kind of a tough question, can be tough to implement. Uh, definitely, if, you, if anyone's really interested in, in math and game theory, that's a rabbit hole. I've, I've fallen down at work before reading, reading about all the different auction theories and how, how you can really uh, make this work and, and make it successful. Well, the nice thing about parking is you could do it in a pilot project like San Francisco did with its SF Park. You don't have to try it out everywhere. It's not like congestion pricing or anything like that. You could do it in one permit district and see how it works. That is it too a stretch too far to try uh, an experiment with a new kind of permit parking district? Uh, that I think you'd learn a lot. I'm sure there'd be a lot of things would go wrong, but. Uh, uh, you would learn how it worked and San Francisco did it with seven pilot zones and now they've extended SF Park to the whole city. But it would be a bad idea to start out with the whole city to begin with. Yeah, it's a big, a big, big, uh, big city we've, we've got here. Um, yeah, so I think uh, it's important for us to, to, to talk about the, the equity uh, ang angle again. We've got some great, great questions. It's, that's a lot of what's, what's going on in the chat, I think. Bringing in, bringing in this ability to kind of cross subsidize uh, in, into, into trends is really interesting. Um, and, and, and there's also this the question of could the cost of a residential parking permit uh, be based on income level? I think that's, that, that is something that, um, that is really interesting. I think it's SFMTA, we have this sort of transit first policy and it does make it seem like that by subsidizing that, that, that we're making that uh, a, a little difficult. I know, Chris, I know that there's some questions about cross subsidy within within Prop 218, and, and if if we're kind of working under that framework, there's a question about that. I don't know if you could uh, address that for us. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any problem with from a from a legal perspective with using um, the money to subsidize any group of interest that you might want to subsidize. Um, again, so long as the the fee is characterized and accepted by the courts as a fee charged for access to public property, that is the street or the curb lane, rather than a fee which is an incident to ownership of private property, that is the lot or the leasehold interest you have in an apartment building. Um, how the city uses the revenue is totally up to the city. So I think there's not, there's not any legal barrier to using the revenue, um, however the city wants to use the revenue. Well, I, I, I would add to that, that uh, any city, if they worried about low income drivers, you could give a, a discount for low income and uh, low income drivers. We give a discount on electricity bills or water bills for low income people. You could do the same thing for, for parking. But I think it would be a mistake to give a subsidy only for people who uh, poor people who own a car and park on the street. If you're going to give a discount to somebody who owns a car and wants to park on the street, you want to give the same uh, subsidy to other low income, equally low income people, uh, say for transit passes or car club memberships or, or whatever. I think it'd be a bad idea to give a discount uh, to low income drivers and nothing to other low income people. That's another subsidy for cars. You yeah, have to I, buy a car to get the subsidy. I, I don't understand why you would tie the subsidy to car ownership at all, or even 
that's they use it for transit. I mean, if you're concerned about equity, why mm -hmm. don't you spend the revenue on early childhood education? Yes, or childcare, or or, or any child number care. of yeah. things. Yeah, I think I think that's that is the the sort of the interesting kind of framework that oftentimes gets talked about a lot of different issues, but we don't really we talk about it occasionally when when people talk about freeway projects, saying how we're, we're subsidizing the oil companies. But when it comes to parking, you never you never really hear it framed that way. Um, and, and a lot of that is because we don't have a, a question, we don't have a full value of what that cost is, which is sort of what we're getting. And I think what a what an auction would help at. Uh, and then there's also the aspect of not really having uh, a, a full understanding of just in general car driving uh, and some of the negative externalities of that. I think that um, that that if, if there were a way to sort of calculate that that value. Um, it's a little tougher. So I'm curious if your thoughts on why sort of kind of the, the market market rate approach is kind of more preferable to approach where we, we look at the cost to society of the residential parking. Um, how would that kind of look and how would that be, be different if you're sort of looking at based on that as opposed to basing on what people would pay for, for a space? And that's a bit, a bit meta. I can... I can address that a little bit, I, I think, which is that um, there's an opportunity cost to the use of the curb lane for cars. And part of that opportunity cost is somebody else's ability to park a car or a, a or park conveniently a car or a bike or a shared transit vehicle in that lane. But there are other things that are opportunity costs of the use of that space for a car, like it could be planted with trees or it could be used for park benches. And those public uses that Anna talked about earlier, I think are a little bit harder to capture through the um, uh, auction model because um, the people who would provide those uses um, wouldn't capture the benefits personally, right? They would be more they would be more dispersed. However, I think we would see in the auction model, even if not fully efficient provision of those public uses, we would see substantial provision of those public uses. So um, there was there was talk about uh, Valencia Street earlier. One of my favorite parklets on Valencia Street is uh, Trixie the Triceratops uh, parklet, which is a uh, in front of a private home, and it was built by the homeowner to create- I knew you were going to say that, yes. <laughs> the lovely space for the public. If you look at what's been happening in uh, um, the Bernal Hill neighborhood, which is adjacent to where I live during, during the COVID, every evening people come out and play music on their porches. I'm mm -hmm. sure there are people in Bernal who would bid for street space and use it to build parklets for music performance. Um, and so even though we might not have as much of that type of activity as one would want through an auction model, I think we would have much more of it than we have now where the only thing you're allowed to bid to use the curb for, mm -hmm. you're not even bidding, you're just applying mm -hmm. that residential parking sticker is for parking. I want to give a plug yeah. to, um, to the, the folks on, who live on Sanchez Street, which is not far from where you're describing. I don't know them super well, but um, they're one of the slow streets that has been designated by the SFMTA, and they've taken it upon themselves to start a new governance model. Um, their organization is called Slow Sanchez, and they're trying to make it permanent. Um, and they are they're in, they've got a really nice it's a it's a really nice street to do it on, um, and they're in the middle of trying to figure this out for themselves. What does it look like to place a higher use um, in that space exactly as you described, Christo? Yeah, and that sort of strikes me as kind of a more, um, someone mentioned tactical urbanism in the, in the chat and it, tactical urbanism, this idea that we, um, that, that folks could just go out in the street and kind of do whatever and, and make it work. And it oftentimes ends up creating things that either get codified or at the very least create things that the community kind of rallies around. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to sort of see a, a very sort of organized form of that building off what's, what's been going on uh, to be able to, to create this, this community space um, but yeah, I think Chris made made a good point that that this idea that we uh, 
once once you start trying to put a dollar value, um, especially in San Francisco, things start getting expensive. Um, and that's that's where these governance models that, that Anna was talking about come back into play, where you have this idea of um, the, this governance model of trying to reserve some of that space for those sorts of things and how do you make that work? And I think um, as, as, as cities kind of uh, try to better understand what, what they're gonna do with the curb, um, that, that, that will be a huge part of it. Uh, we also have some questions about uh, small businesses um, converting uh, off-street parking to more equitable uses of space. I think the, the off-street conversation is, is definitely related to this. Um, when it comes to parking on the street, so many people have access to garages that they don't use. Um, and uh, and I, I think, you know, that, that's also kind of related to what we're seeing in our commercial corridors and, and trying to, 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 to bring people into those off-street spaces. Um, so how do, how do we sort of see the, the interplay between what we're seeing in our, our, our parking minimums and various zoning codes and how does that work and, and interface with these changes on the street and in the curb? Well, San Francisco has gotten rid of parking minimums, um, and I hope other cities as well. Uh, I mean, that <laughs> I think most people don't realize that the parking minimum parking requirements are pulled out of thin air. I mean, it, when planners have to set a parking requirement, it's like improv. Uh, the, <laughs> they they don't know how much the parking spaces cost, or how much they're worth, or how they affect the looks of the area, or urban design. They don't know how they affect traffic congestion, or air pollution, or global warming. They don't know anything. And they, they never, the planners never learned anything about this during their planning education, because the professors have nothing to teach them, because they don't know anything about parking requirements either. But they've been around for, uh, you know, before you were born, and you would think, well, are you, how are you going to uh, dispute about something age old like this? And uh, I think that, uh, that there, the world is moving away from parking requirements. I think that uh, many cities have, 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 big cities have abandoned Mexico City, Sao Paulo. Uh, many cities have abandoned them in the in the midtown areas, but the, the, the closer you look at them, the more they look like they were put together by the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's quite an interesting, you know, part of this world, part of this puzzle. Um, one last one last question. I'll, I'll I'll kind of direct direct this to everybody. What's one thing that one takeaway that people can 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 take and start talking with their neighbors and talking with residents about when it comes to thinking about the residential curb and thinking about the curb as public space. Uh, how, how, how should people be having those conversations with, with people around them? Uh, Anna, I'll let you go first. I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, I just put something in the chat for, for folks who are interested in more resources since it seems like there's some energy around tactical urbanism and thinking creatively about the curb. Um, I had the pleasure of starting a little pop-up organization called the National Street Service. Um, interestingly, it was a project um, put out by Ford Motor Company, who's thinking, trying to think differently about how they interface um, with cities. Um, so we, we started cohorts in two cities that we thought could be the most different from one another, Boise and Philadelphia. And we developed a little toolkit for folks to try to re basically reprogram how they think about streets. Um, and there's sort of a step-by-step -step toolkit for thinking differently about what streets mean to you and what you might want to get out of that space. So I know we're short on time. So my my advice to everybody out there who's trying to rethink their street, rethink their residential street parking is just to spend 10 minutes on your street, just observing what happens there. Just set a timer on your phone, put your phone in your pocket, just observe what happens on your street. You might get inspired. Well, I think you could look at from the air. Google allows you to look at all of these streets all the time. And when you look at any street, parked cars are much more common than cars that are moving. Cars are parked 95% of the time. And when you look at the, the rubber beats the road in a parking space uh, because the cars are moving just only 5% of the time. And another bad thing in California and every place else is the minimum street widths. In the uh, California code, the minimum width of the street is, is 40 feet. So you could have two parking lanes of eight feet wide and two travel lanes of 12 feet wide. So 40% of all the streets are for parking. Um, 
And I think that uh, if we were, had uh, allowed neighbors uh, uh, narrower streets, uh, we would have more space for people. Um, so I think we have some sort of very old things in our, in our code that would, uh, when you look at it very carefully, you say, well, why is it exactly 40 feet? Or how do you know that, that a restaurant requires exactly 12 spaces per thousand square feet? You know, they don't know anything, but they know exactly the number of spaces to require. How is that happening? Well, it's because it, nobody <laughs> until you came along is, is uh, trying to pull back the curtain and see the, the, you know, the Wizard of Oz, you know, uh, sort of um, pulling levers and pushing <laughs> dials and things like that and say, uh, the, the, the great Oz has spoken. Um, so I think that a, a lot of cities are, 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 are not much more informed than the Wizard of Oz. Because as the Wizard of Oz said, you, you make me do things that no, everybody knows can't be done. You make me require the exact number of parking spaces when everybody should know there is no way to do this. And when we have done it, it has been a, you know, a, a real terrible disaster because the, the off-street parking space, the required off-street parking spaces, push the buildings farther apart. Um, and that makes walking and bicycling less pleasant. Uh, the traffic is congested. Uh, the default way to travel is to buy a car if you can park free when you get there. Uh, that means the parking requirements have to go up. So I think that the, the the, the, the most wonderful thing about our current position is that there's so many improvements that we can make by stopping doing bad things. If we stop doing bad things, we can we will have a much better life. It's not like we're living in Pakistan where you have to do. <laughs> yeah, the, the, their problem is not that they're doing a lot of bad things. Our our problem at the state, local, and national level is that we're doing a lot of bad things. But I think when it comes to parking, we can reform these. Yeah, it's definitely exciting time. Chris, any last, any, any uh, thoughts on how to, to I'll, get out? I'll just say that, uh, that neither Proposition 26 nor Proposition 218 uh, will stop you from stopping doing bad things. So there's a lot of choices that are available to cities. That's great. Well. Thank you so much. Thanks again to uh, Urban Environmentalists and, and Streets for People uh, and, and Spur. This has been a great, great conversation. And I, I think this is hopefully the beginning of a long, long journey for, for a lot of the folks listening to, to think more about the, the true cost of the, the parking in front of their houses or in front of their apartment buildings uh, and thinking about how to, 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 better, to better use that for the greater good of the community. Great. Thank, thank you guys so much. Thank you for so much. For coming Thank you. Out. Yeah, looking forward to, to more more conversation.